Welcome back, everybody, to another Extra History Reaction Series. Well, uh, I mentioned a couple of days ago that we are going to be doing a series on the history uh, of Turkey and of the Ottoman Empire, and that is coming next week. That'll be after this series concludes. But I've wanted to do this one for a while now, and while I continue to work on some editing of some of my original content, uh, I wanted to dive into Extra History from Extra Credits is the name of the channel. Uh, on Teddy the T Trust Buster, obviously referring to Theodore Roosevelt uh, and his history of trust busting. Uh, if you have not seen the History Channel's series, The Men Who Built America, I highly recommend it. It'll give you a lot more detail into this time period, talking about people like Rockefeller and the like. I have not seen the Extra History series yet that we're about to react to, but I have a feeling I have a pretty good idea of who it's about, Rockefeller in particular, who was one of the big opponents of the Roosevelt administration during all of this. So I'll offer my own feedback as we go along. As always, check out some of the links in the description below. Make sure you support Extra credits uh, and their original content. Give them a like. Check out the original link in the description below. But let's go ahead and dive into part one of Extra History's Teddy the Trust Busters. Titusville, Pennsylvania, 1872. Down with the conspirators, reads one banner. No compromise, says another. The protesters, small independent oil refiners, march toward the railroad junction, led by local oil man Franklin Tarbell. They swarm over the rail yard flipping rail cars, spilling their cargo of oil barrels, and smashing open any marked with the Standard Oil logo. So, um, yeah, we're going to talk about Standard Oil and John D. Rockefeller in just a minute. Um, so Titusville, Pennsylvania is in Venango County, which is in western PA. If you look at Pittsburgh and just draw a line north, maybe an hour or so north, uh, like 70, 80 miles, something like that, you find Titusville. It's a small town uh, in Venango County. Uh, really kind of out of the way. It's not really near anything important, but it's where they find oil. Um, and it becomes one of the early sources of crude oil. Up until this time, oil was kind of an afterthought. It wasn't really something that was used all that much. Uh, primarily things like whale oil were used uh, for, for, whale lamp, for oil lamps and things like that. But oil wasn't really a major player on the world stage the way it is today. That really starts to change because of things like what happened in Titusville. And so oil then, getting that oil from that kind of remote place like Titusville to the major centers of industry like New York or even eventually somewhere like Pittsburgh uh, is going to re rely on rail. And that's where John D. Rockefeller comes in. He's not initially necessarily strictly an oil baron, but he's the guy who is able to make oil into a necessary component of society. News has leaked that John D. Rockefeller's rising giant, the Standard Oil Company, has brokered a secret deal with the railroads. The rail barons will double their transportation rates on all oil producers, but give Standard a rebate, driving small independent producers out of business so Rockefeller can buy them out. But despite the Pennsylvania legislature dissolving this backroom deal, things are already in motion. So Rockefeller, he, he's actually from the Cleveland area, uh, which is not far from Titusville. Uh, and yeah, like I said, if you watch uh, something like um, History Channel's uh, Men Who Build America, you'll really get a lot of the background into how Rockefeller made his money. Uh, I actually visited John D. Rockefeller's grave recently up in Lakeview Cemetery in Cleveland, and he's very, buried very near to the guy who ran the, the rail company that helped make him rich. And I tell a little bit of that story there. Through strong arm tactics and ruthless expansion, Standard will soon control the U.S. oil market, making Rockefeller the richest person on earth. Franklin Tarbell cannot stop Rockefeller. No man can. Because it will be Franklin's 14-year-old daughter, Ida, who will break Standard Oil. Thanks so much to CuriosityStream for helping to keep this history flowing. To get a discounted deal with Nebula included, check out the link in the description below. By the turn of the 20th century, a few massive corporations, often called the Trusts, due to the corporate structure they were organized under, dominated American life. From railroads to meat to steel and oil, Trusts strangled competition and wielded more political power than many senators and governors. So this is actually the onset of the time when you start to have... Uh, for example, the Republican Party 
closely allied with big business and and why to this day people talk about that connection. It really starts here. Uh, The McKinley campaign was one of the first presidential campaigns that was largely funded by a couple of really rich, influential people. Uh, I'm not saying necessarily that William McKinley wasn't his own man or that he was bought out in some way, but these men did finance his campaign. Um, And uh, so this is when money is power for really kind of the first time in the United States history. And these trusts, they were, they were able to just buy out any competition. And you can't even really compare it to something like Walmart, for example, today, though there are some elements of that. So Walmart, for example, will go to Heinz and say, listen, Heinz, you sell us your ketchup and your other products for less than you sell it to the mom and pop place down the street. That's why Walmart's able to sell stuff so cheap is because they negotiate these deals that make things cheaper on their end of purchasing so that then they can turn around and sell them cheaper. And people like Rockefeller did the same kind of thing. They made deals where they would promise to buy large amounts of something in return for being able to get it at a cheaper rate. Uh, and then they would use the, the profits they made from that to buy out all the competition who couldn't compete with their uh, financial deals that they were able to make. And, and then they started to gobble up all the areas of things. So Standard Oil wasn't just making oil. They were also selling the oil. They were also controlling the rail that transported the oil. They were controlling all means of production. And that's why they became these trusts. They controlled everything from beginning to end. But in 1901, the trusts would find a new opponent, a president unexpectedly thrust into the role, Theodore Roosevelt, who would usher in the era of trust busting. Yet the story of trust busting doesn't begin with him. So, and it's interesting with Theodore Roosevelt too, we've talked about this. Theodore Roosevelt, nobody expected him to become president. They actually made him vice president to get him out of the way. He was governor of New York at the time. Uh, He was not your typical Republican at that time, wasn't your typical pro-business kind of guy. He was very progressive as far as Republicans go. Um, But they made him vice president on the ticket with McKinley to shut him up, basically, to put him in a seemingly insignificant and less influential role than he had as governor of New York as being very outspoken. Well, he becomes president when McKinley gets assassinated, and you go from McKinley, who was supported by these big businesses to now the president being his former vice president who actually ends up being a threat to those same businesses. Because while Roosevelt disliked the monopolies to take on such powerful business interests, he would need massive public support for action. Public support that would not come from Washington, but from a magazine office. The offices of McClure's Magazine, New York City, 1901. In the 31 years after her father fought Standard in Titusville, Ida Tarbell has come a long way. She's now 44 years old and an editor at the prestigious magazine McClure's. One of the few American women with a science degree, she became a specialist in writing about technical topics like public works and the military, as well as blockbuster serialized biographies of Napoleon and Abraham Lincoln. You know, this is one of those things that I don't think people talk about enough. Women at this time in history don't necessarily have the roles where they're in charge. You know, they don't even have the right to vote yet. Um, They're not in Congress. They're not president. They're not in the cabinet, stuff like that. But women found ways to be influential. You know, the prohibition movement, for example, was a lot of that was from the women's temperance movements. Um, You know, and here's another example of a woman finding a, a place to be influential and having a a huge impact on American history without necessarily doing it in the traditional way. But as Tarbell and her research assistant shuffle through contracts, corporate documents, legislative transcripts, and interviews, it's quickly becoming clear that this next story will be her biggest yet. A history of the Standard Oil Company, its rise, and its misdeeds. A series so dangerous that Tarbell's father warns her not to do it. In fact, the magazine's funding has already been threatened by a Rockefeller-owned bank. But Tarbell practices a new kind of journalism, one that relies on public documents, legislative and court transcripts, and verifiable facts. And again, so you hear that little tidbit where they mention that a bank controlled by Rockefeller is threatening them. You know, if you're a business, you will get swamped 
by the money and power of a company by like Standard Oil. So that's why you really only have the government to turn to. Because Standard Oil, with all the money and power and influence they have, they can influence the banks. They can influence the courts. They can bog you down with lead, with legal, uh, be bombarded with legal issues to where you just go under just trying to defend yourself. In addition to interviews. It's so new that the discipline doesn't even have a name yet, though today we call it investigative journalism. Now, the magazine decided to look at Standard because, unlike the rest of the trusts, it had a single owner and will be an easier story to tell. The history of Standard will provide a window into how these companies control American commerce. And Tarbell's first task is looking at the earliest days of Standard Oil and its founder, John D. Rockefeller. Born in upstate New York in 1839, Rockefeller grew up in financial insecurity. His father, Doc Rockefeller, was a con artist who masqueraded as a doctor. So you, today, we have the term snake oil salesman. This was a big, big thing. This is before people had all the knowledge that we have today about science and medicine and things like that. And so you had these people who were traveling salesmen who would come to a town and say, I've got this new cure. You know, drink this arsenic and it will cure your cancer. I I'm kind of exaggerating a little bit but that's the kind of thing and you you can look at newspapers from the day and see advertisements and it'll say like you know mrs jones over on third street swears by this oil that she uses and she applies three times a day and it has cured her smallpox you know that kind of thing um and, and so this was a big big deal and people would would jump into this uh, sometimes they believed in the products they were selling. Other times they knew it was stuff that really didn't work, but they preyed on people's lack of education and lack of knowledge in those areas to try and make a quick buck. Selling fake cures on the road. So during his absence, John was forced to step up, raising turkeys to help the family. His mother, a devout Baptist, taught him the principles of hard work, thrift, and charitable giving. While his father, by contrast, taught his children by swindling them as a way to keep them sharp. In fact, once, Doc Rockefeller held out his arms, urging young John to jump from a high chair Trust to fall. his grasp. Then, when John took the leap, Doc just let him fall. I understand what he was trying to do, but what kind of a jerk are you to do that to your kid? I, as a dad, uh -uh. I am never doing that kind of crap to my kid. But I understand what he was trying to accomplish with that. But, uh, boy, imagine what that did to Rockefeller his psyche and how it formed him at such an early age how to think never trust anyone completely he told his son even me doc ditched the family when rockefeller was 16 disappearing from public record young john became a bookkeeper to support the family and then by age 20 had gone into business for himself branching into refining oil with several partners but by 1870 he'd pushed said partners out and took control of what was now dubbed standard oil America ran on oil, specifically kerosene, which lit homes in a way that was cleaner and more efficient than whale oil. And that was exactly how Rockefeller liked things, clean and efficient. And as Tarbell researches his methods, she finds herself impressed, indeed even admiring Rockefeller. So Rockefeller then starts to, and like I said, if you watch the men who built America, they give you all the details on this. He starts to buy not only the source of production but the means of production the transportation in between he starts to to get his hand into all of these things he starts to find new ways because remember um the idea of refining oil is to separate oil into its component parts kerosene is part gasoline's another um and so you know you would use the kerosene from the oil but what do you do with the rest of it you know taking that crude oil and, and refining it uh, and so it was finding new um reasons uh, what's the word i'm looking for finding new ways to use the other byproducts of crude oil uh, and then being able to sell and market those as well he was a major innovator because at the time when refining petroleum often only oh, about 60 percent i just said that usable as kerosene while much of the rest were flammable byproducts that they dumped into rivers and lakes making them occasionally catch on fire but rockefeller in cleveland many of these byproducts into lubricants chewing gum paint and even figured out that one of the biggest waste products gasoline could fuel his factory machinery and while tarbell applauded these innovations her admiration didn't extend to rockefeller's business practices he expanded aggressively buying out his competitors and if they didn't take his offer he'd undercut their prices yep. and dive rivals into unprofitability before purchasing the ruined corporations 
And this was a thing he didn't just do to rivals, but also friends who'd helped him get started in business. His father told him don't ever trust anybody, but that's advice that other people should have taken when dealing with him, apparently, as well. He also began to expand vertically, buying barrel makers, oil producers, distributors, lumber companies, and Trust. chemical manufacturers. Buying so everything. he could control every part of the supply and distribution chain. And eventually, he would invest in pipelines, so Standard could stop paying railroads and move its product more efficiently. Rockefeller also had, let's say, a strange feeling about capitalism and money. He looked on his mission to expand Standard as almost a divine calling. In his mind, he was making the oil market more efficient and costs lower. He treated employees well and rewarded those who took his buyouts. But if they resisted, he bankrupted them without mercy, often via secret deals. So it's interesting, and I never had heard that part before, that he actually thought what he was doing was actually helpful to the consumer. But honestly, if you think about it, driving out all the biz all the opposition and all the business i understand that controlling all the means of production can lower costs but when you have no competition you have no reason to lower your costs once you control everything you can raise it to whatever you want to and find that sweet spot where you can make the money so uh kind of dirty it was god's will he believed for the strong and well run to conquer the weak and inefficient in 1872, Standard bought 22 of its 26 rival oil producers in Ohio within three months, an event remembered as the Cleveland, the Cleveland Massacre. Massacre. And it was only the start. For within a decade, Standard would control 90% of the U.S. oil market and about 85% of the global market. As she begins to write, Tarbell reflects that she does not begrudge Rockefeller's success or even Standard's growth. It's the tactics she considers unfair. Standard offering products at such a discount that competition was forced to sell and become part of it. The backroom deals, bribery of public officials, tactics like the South Improvement Company, the entity formed in order to facilitate the secret deal between Standard and the railroad companies that put her father out of business. Mm. She finds a book about Pennsylvania's investigation of the deal in the New York Public Library the only remaining copy after Standard destroyed the rest. <laughs> she gathers details from legislative minutes and lawsuits, turning rumor into fact, forming a picture of the Southern Improvement Scheme, and uncovering evidence that even after the deal fell apart, Standard continued to collude with the railroads to get anti-competitive rebates on shipping its products. So it's interesting that, you know, it took this long for somebody to start digging into all this stuff. You have to figure that Rockefeller made a lot of enemies by putting so many people out of business and, and bullying so many people with his money and his power and his influence. Uh, good for this woman for being the one who was willing to do the dirty work and to dig and to, to compile the evidence to make this happen. I'm just surprised it took as long as it did. But she finds more than that. Crossing the country, she talks to grocers driven out of business by Standard. Standard employees would come threaten them, saying that if the grocers refused to switch to Standard products, the company would open a rival store. Hmm. And they would follow through, offering such discounted goods that no grocer could survive. She also charted how Standard's reorganization as a trust in 1885 actually circumvented antitrust laws. Many states forbid a single company working across state lines. So, Standard formed a trust company in New York that gave orders to smaller state-based companies with names like Standard of Ohio. In truth, Rockefeller... And Standard of Ohio still existed when I was a child. Um, it was eventually bought out by BP. But when I was a kid, there were no BP gas stations. There was Sohio, which is Standard of Ohio, which I can still remember seeing their logo, which looked much like the Standard logo with the red, white, and blue. It just said Sohio on it instead. Feller controlled them all. But Tarbell had an odd ally in understanding Standard, Henry Rogers, the trust's vice president. Believing the articles will be complimentary, he granted her access, answering every charge she made, helping her understand Standard's perspective. However, when the article is published, he would not like what she had to say, because she'd learned far more than Rogers knew, and she learned it from an unusual source. 1904, New York City. Tarbell can see the man is nervous. He wants to leave. He stammers out a story about a kid he teaches in Sunday school, an office boy at Standard Headquarters, the one who burns documents. Hmm. Except when the boy saw his teacher's name on some of the papers, rather than putting them in the furnace, he brought them to him instead. The man you see is also a small-time oil refiner. 
Tarbell opens the man's briefcase and sees a stack of paper. Wow. Price lists, train tables, distribution routes, all with dates and amounts. But none of these are for Standard's products. They're for Standard's competitors. And this information is all Standard needs to undercut its rivals, uh. flood markets, and manipulate oil prices to stay on top. It's hard evidence of something that Tarbell has suspected for years. Standard bribes railroad agents yep. to provide data on its competitor shipments. Rockefeller isn't preternaturally good at reading the market. He's just running a nationwide espionage network. It's, in some ways, you could argue that the guy's like a mob boss. I mean, he's got all the same kind of tactics at play, using money and influence and fear and bribery to get what he wants and to get ahead. And it's this revelation that will win her the support and attention of a new fan, President Theodore Roosevelt. But stop the presses, because we've got an exclusive. All right, so, uh, and I will say this as we move forward with this. Good for Theodore Roosevelt, because that was kind of, in some ways, going against his own self-interest. Because he was going against the very people who supported his party. And so that tells you a little bit about him as a, a human being, and as someone who had integrity that rose above party politics into doing the right thing. Uh, but I'm interested to learn more about this. There's some things there I did not know before. Let me know your thoughts about all this. I think this will be a fun topic to discuss further. And we'll see you tomorrow with episode two. Thanks for watching.